started on our next session, the Science and Religion Dialogue 2, Projects in Leading Institutions. My name's Janet Soskis, and I'm Professor of Philosophical Theology at the University of Cambridge. Um, uh, my uh, doctorate was on metaphor in religious language, and I ended up working with a philosopher of science at Oxford who was interested <coughs> in metaphor and model and scientific theory construction and a defense of scientific realism in and, uh, religious critical realism. And then I've been involved in issues to do with medical ethics, eschatology, anthropology. Uh, most recently, my interest is in creation ex nihilo and the doctrine of God. Um, but it's a great pleasure now to introduce Dennis Alexander uh, from Cambridge and the Faraday Institute. OK, thank you very much. And again, thank you very much to Michael and the other organizers for this wonderful occasion. So it's a great privilege to be here. Um, just very briefly, I've spent the past uh, 40 years of my life in the biological research community mm -hmm. and uh, closed down my laboratory finally in the summer of 2008 as a laboratory working in the area of, of molecular immunology uh, in an institute just outside Cambridge. Uh, in 2006, I and a colleague, uh, Bob White, who's professor of geophysics at the University of Cambridge, um, established the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion as part of St. Edmunds College, where we're both fellows. And you'll know the structure of Cambridge um, is multi-dimensional. Uh, it's, uh, it's a multiverse, uh, where we have 31 different colleges, which are all interdisciplinary. And so it seemed a very natural place to locate uh, an institute of science and religion within uh, a college of that kind. Um, so my brief is very enjoyable, really. I've just got to tell you a few of the things we've been doing in the past uh, uh, seven years, nearly seven years since we set up. I should mention, by the way, that I stepped down as director of the Farad Institute just three weeks ago, um, and so Bob White is now the new director. Um, so just a couple of things about the general activities uh, of the Institute, and then I'll tell you some of the, uh, the highlights or different projects we've been involved in over the past <laughs> few years. We currently have 14 uh, staff members, administration and research. Um, we focus very much on academic research and science religion, uh, but we're also very interested in public dissemination and also in stimulating discourse, uh, sensible discourse about science religion within the academic research community, and especially, I think, the scientific research community. So this is our bread and butter. We have these regular activities of seminars, public lectures. Uh, we have uh, major public lectures each term where we have a dinner discussion afterwards. We try and engage different people in that discussion who might not normally perhaps um, end up around a table with people like John Pocking or and others. Um, so we've had Stephen Hawking and the Archbishop of Canterbury, all kinds of different people along to these dinner discussions. Um, and we have quite a focus on, some, on, on courses. So we do short weekend courses. Uh, the idea is scientists can come into the courses and be back in the lab on Monday morning. We have summer courses and increasingly uh, Faraday courses overseas by invitation. Uh, next year we've got some courses in Mexico, in Guatemala, uh, and an increasing range. We, we see our role as catalytic. Uh, we're not seeking to establish some Faraday organization anywhere, but simply to uh, perhaps initiate one course, which can then be give people the idea that this is a great thing to do. We want to do more of these. So, now I always feel that the um, there is a relationship in these um, Tumbleton funded grants and other grants, of course, as well. There's a balance between academic research and public dissemination, which I put up a spectrum there. But um, and so we always see our projects really as as a mingling of both, um, but also. Uh, that they actually um, have aspects of both in them, but they might orientate more in an academic direction or possibly more in a, a specifically public dissemination direction. Up on the public dissemination side, um, we've always had the policy since the beginning of just, if anything moves, we film it. Okay, so <laughs> we film everything, and that means that we have a very large collection of science religion lectures up, up on our website. And as of a couple of years ago, in fact, we have... Um, most of them, 323, I just had a look, up on the University of Cambridge video streaming website. Uh, we also have uh, a presence on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Um, we have a Faraday phone app, which is about to be launched and so on. So we, we do really believe in dissemination. I think it's a very important part. And I just want to show you that. Um, this is from the University of Cambridge website, uh, which I uh, copied a couple of days ago. And this just simply shows that since the beginning of 2011, when we started 
we were invited to post all our lectures up on the Cambridge University website. There has been a, a very significant uh, impact, I think, in terms of number of downloads and so on. Um, I, I think it's total view, 600,000 so far. Um, we are actually, out of the 99 different institutes posted on that website, that includes all the Cambridge colleges, we're actually uh, the eighth out of the 99 in terms of just the sheer number of people who are uh, looking at that material. So we're encouraged by that. Okay, so I just want to mention um, some briefly a few projects that we're involved in, uh, which range from across that spectrum from more pure academia up much more in the direction of pure, if you like, pure dissemination. Uses and abuses of biology uh, is a very interesting history, actually, because this shows how an, a, a Templeton Advisory Board meeting can be used to initiate an idea. In fact, the idea was uh, seeded in Vienna in May 2006 with a paper being discussed there about, isn't it amazing how much um, science is, is used and abused for all kinds of uh, goals, political, social, religious, well beyond its original context, and that happens, of course, especially in the area of biology. And so we set up a Faraday Writer's Workshop um, to look at that his, more historically. That led to a book called The Biology and Ideology from Descartes to Dawkins, uh, which uh, was published a few years ago now by the University of Chicago Press. And then in turn, this led to a subgrants program, which is very active at the moment. In fact, it was only initiated on August last year, and we've just given out 17 grants. And we're about to give out three essay prizes on that whole theme of how is biology utilized in all kinds of biological and non-biological ways in all kinds of arenas. And we had a very good um, crop of applications for this program, so we're quite excited about that. There'll be a workshop on that next year and so on. <coughs> Secondly, still up the fairly academic end of things, we recently last year had um, the Georges Lemaitre Anniversary Conference uh, at Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. This was to mark the 1931 paper um, the primeval atom, actually, and we should have really, I suppose, um, marked the, the French publication, but we marked the English publication, uh, 1931, of that paper. Um, you may not know that, actually, Georges Lemaitre is, a, is an alumni, alumnus of St. Edmund's College, so we were particularly pleased to, um, to have this conference in Cambridge, organized by Rodney Holder, who's uh, been our course director over these past seven years. Um, we had a, a wonderful lineup of speakers, I think a very good engagement by the delegates who came. We had four Templeton Prize winners, there they are, who were amongst the speakers and so on. And that's now led to um, this book, George Lemaitre, Life, Science and Legacy, which is about to be published by Springer. Uh, Rodney Holder's got this rather good book, I'd recommend it, uh, Natural Theology and the Legacy of Karl Barth, recently been published by the Templeton Foundation Pri Press. So there's a number of activities which have come out of that particular conference. Now sort of moving more in the slightly more um, dissemination direction, although uh, with a strong academic base. Um, we wanted, in 2009, University of Cambridge celebrated its 800th um, anniversary, its birthday of its founding. And as the Faraday Institute, we wanted to mark it with something that would be highly relevant to Cambridge and would also engage people in a new way in the science-religion dialogue. And so we sponsored a play which came to be called Let Newton Be. Uh, it was written by this very fine playwright, Craig Baxter. It's a play based on the verbatim writings of Newton and his contemporaries. Um, it was produced by the Menagerie Theatre Company, and we launched it at uh, Newton's Old College, Trinity College, in 2009. It was hosted by Lord Martin Rees, and it was introduced by Stephen Hawking. And the play has really taken off and been, I think, highly successful. It's toured in... Uh, the UK, also in the USA, uh, Canada, and so on, and has really led to some very fine positive reviews. We had a full-page review in Nature, a full-page review in uh, The New Scientist, another one in Science, and other publications. So it's helped, I think, to engage an audience that would not normally be interested in science religion um, by celebrating the life of an iconic, fascinating, iconoclastic, and lots of words you could use for Newton, um, actually, the play bases the whole theme of Newton around three Newtons. There's the young Newton, uh, there's the Newton at Cambridge, and there's the older Newton, the famous Newton. Uh, and these three interlocutors sort of interact with each other, three Newtons on the stage all at the same time. It's a fascinating play. And I think what makes it more powerful is by having post-production 
discussions where you can engage with the audience. There's one example there. We did a performance at the Royal Society um, and had a good discussion afterwards with that particular panel of, uh, of Newton experts. We also have a book tie-in. So we have a book coming out hopefully in a few weeks' time called the Isaac Newton Guidebook, where we've got um, a number of new essays by different experts in the Newton field, um, 86 illustrations, and we're hoping to get it out by Christmas. I'll do a plug for it now, mm -hmm. um, if we can get it over from India. It's being printed in Bangalore as we speak. So, and Stephen Hawking was um, kind enough to, uh, to do a preface for the book, which I hope will not at least lower the sales. OK, um, so uh, another totally different kind of project is this one, LASA, Learning About Science and Religion. This is an educational project. Um, it's uh, being led by Barry Billingsley, who is a senior lecturer in science education at the University of Reading, collaborating with some people up in Cambridge as well. This is a research project to really find out what it is in the lives of pupils that m make them think that science and religion are in quite different compartments or even in opposition. And so uh, it, uh, it involves um, interviews, surveys with students and teachers in schools. But it's also tied in with um, a very successful website that's now in use in over 500 schools in the UK and also tied in with various workshops. So the idea is to find out, you know, why is it that people end up, you know, with this very separated, compartmentalized view of science religion. And the overall summary is, is here very briefly, and it's no surprise to anyone here, but in the UK educational system, we have um, compulsory religious education, and then, of course, um, the pupils also do science. And what you find, basically, is they go into the classroom with two completely different mindsets, mm -hmm. and they even have a different philosophy of the world, you know, when they're sitting in these two different classrooms. Um, we also found out some quite depressing things, and that's on the bottom bullet point there. A majority of students who describe themselves as Christian believe that the Pope and the bishops of the Church of England believe in a six-day creation. So the power of creationism, unfortunately, in the media means that you know, these young people are ending up with incredible things in their heads. So it's, in a way, a rather depressing um, a sort of uh, research project. This is some of the, the publications, the academic publications that have already come out of this project in the past couple of years and, and quite a few yet to come. So it's been a very fruitful, academically fruitful in terms of publications project. Um, also, though, as I say, um, it's aimed with the, it's got the aim of trying to help the pupils to think through the big questions. So there is this uh, free website, it's got videos, it's very much designed for younger teenagers, uh, lots of clips there of people from different perspectives, but the whole aim of the website is to help pupils to think about the big questions and not to carry on this very compartmentalized way of life. So there are free posters which have gone out to 500 schools. There are workshops in schools. We have people dressing up as Darwin and Galileo and all kinds of things coming in. So, you know, this is fun stuff. I mean, you know, this is not... I, I, anyway, it always seems great fun to me. They just had an event uh, about robots where they had 300 students came to Reading uh, with some robotic people there and uh, had a great time. And, of course, the BBC picked this up. And uh, just uh, last week, actually, um, there was quite a bit of coverage on BBC News and so on of this particular event. And they have some other big events uh, planned for next year. So I, I think it's got a very strong academic base, but there is also a great dissemination aspect um, of this whole project. The last thing I want to mention is this um, Test of Faith project. Um, this is something being led by Dr. Ruth Bankovitz, who's been with us in the Faraday Institute now for a number of years. And the whole aim is to uh, generate resources that will be relevant for the Christian community. And it's specifically aimed at the Christian community to try and um, help people to get on board with science, to be more enthusiastic about science, helping people in the area of evolution and so on. And the core resource that's been generated for this is a, a, a film, a DVD, uh, which has three sections, one section on astronomy, one section on creation and the environment, one section on neurology and ethics. And the whole aim is to uh, watch this as a group and then to get people discussing the things that they watch and so on. Many of the people here in this room, of course, have been involved in the filming of this. And so there are these resources. There's uh, a, study a study guide for group members. There's a leader's guide and so on. So it sort of comes as a package. 
And many youth groups and churches and student groups are using these materials, uh, especially in the UK, Australia, the English-speaking world generally, and North, North America. Um, it has been translated into 10 different languages, so there are subtitles. Uh, it's been dubbed into different languages. It's been shown in Arabic on the Sat7 television uh, system in the Middle East a couple of times and so on. So really reaching really quite large audiences. And it's been adapted also for different groups, again, for secondary school groups, for Christian youth groups, and even uh, a Christian pop group, which you can see in action there. I've never traveled with them myself, I have to say. Um, but Ruth Bankovitz says it's a very exciting experience. And so she goes out sometimes with this group. And believe it or not, this is a group that will then uh, get Ruth standing up front and talking about science religion to young people who would never, ever get involved in any other way other than they begin to listen to a really good uh, pop group. So, you know, there are various ways in which we can disseminate the whole discourse on science religion, not all of them uh, purely academic. Uh, and just, I will leave that slide on the board because my time now is up, but without talking about it, just to say that we have a whole um, range now of seven new projects, uh, which we're very enthusiastic about, um, which range uh, across the brain, uh, genes, determinism, and God, um, and a number of other projects that we're involved in, uh, which are part of a whole new funding enterprise that we have now for the next uh, couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>